The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. Am I a God nearby, says the Lord, and not a God far off? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said, who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will the hearts of the prophets ever turn back? Those who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart? They plan to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, just as their ancestors forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let the one who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? The word of the Lord. Our psalm for this morning is the 82nd Psalm. Let us read responsibly by half verse. God takes his stand in the council of heaven. He judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly? And show favor to the wicked. Save the weak and the orphan. Defend the humble and needy. Rescue the weak and the poor. They do not know, neither do they understand. They go about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Now I say to you, you are gods. And all your children of the Most High. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals. And and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, and rule the earth. A reading from the book of Hebrews. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been circled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, run strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. 
They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended by their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had promised something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it is going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord. is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Please be seated. Every Sunday when I'm preaching, I stand up here before you all, and rather than pray to God, I already do that when I'm over there, I offer an opening sentence, kind of like a thesis statement-ish. Maybe more like a theme or a summary statement. 
pulled from the scripture reading from which I'm about to preach or from which I'm about to primarily preach. Today, though, I did not. I'm not sure if you noticed, but my opening line was not from today's readings. It is from the letter to the Hebrews. It's even from the 11th chapter of the letter to the Hebrews, both of which are relevant for today's readings. But my opening line today is from the very first line of the 11th chapter of the letter to the Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. This 11th chapter is about faith, and it runs into the 12th chapter in which Jesus is portrayed as the perfect example of faith. And thus, it seems the author of the Hebrews is doing exactly what I do, at least with the 11th and 12th chapters of the letter, offering a summary statement and then giving a message. So again, my summary statement. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And it seems that all of our readings are at least a little bit about this statement. The Old Testament reading is about a God who promises to be omnipresent and calls out the false prophets who are spreading lies about God's true nature and presence. And the psalm is about calling upon God to do what God promises to do, to save, to defend, to rescue, to deliver, especially the least of these in our midst. Of course, Hebrews is about faith. After all, it seems to give a list of historical examples of faith some very promising, and some very much not promising. And then it's the Gospel reading from Luke. Oddly, I would like to also propose that this passage, or pericope, that's the word for a story within Scripture, this pericope is also about faith. About faith in a God, in a Messiah, who may bring fire and destruction and also will bring peace and hope. After all, this passage is from Luke's gospel, a gospel that begins with the story of a chosen one who will give birth to a king and about said king who will rule over all of heaven and earth with peace and love. How do we reconcile such a violent and disruptive message from a Messiah whose birth was heralded by angels singing glory to God and peace on earth? Imagine hearing this pericope the morning after a big fight with your daughter or your father. Imagine hearing it after hanging up on your mother or your son-in-law in anger over something they said or did. Imagine hearing this pericope at a time when you haven't spoken to a family member in months, when family members are threatening legal action against you, when family members are acting as anything but family. Perhaps placing it in our own context of anger and arguments makes it almost too intimate, too pointed, too accusatory, especially from a Messiah who comes to serve, who comes as a sacrifice, who comes preaching love. A Messiah who tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves. And a gospel telling that does indeed include the Good Samaritan and the prodigal son. No wonder I didn't pull a line from this reading for my thematic statement this week. <laughs> One thing I do want to point out is that all of these readings, God is making promises. Promises to always be present. Promises to always save and defend, rescue and deliver. Promises to give each and every one of us a Jesus to be the pioneer and perfecter. And promises that, yes, fire will come and division will come. And also something else will come too. Faith is believing in God's promises, trusting God, knowing God will deliver even if we won't or don't understand what exactly the promise is or when exactly the delivery will be. 
And yet, even having faith in God, even believing that God will deliver on all of God's promises, even hoping that God is true and real and honest and all those other things we believe, even with all of that, faith still seems to be oddly ambiguous. I mean, just look at this passage from the letter to the Hebrews. Yes, faith can part the Red Sea and blast the trumpet horn extra loud. And yes, faith can conquer kingdoms and administer justice and shut the mouths of lions and quench raging fires and escape the edge of a sword. And faith can lead to torture and suffering, mocking, flogging, chains, imprisonment, and some pretty harsh ways of dying. So if we are told to have faith, have hope, believe in God, believe in Jesus, why doesn't this faith protect us from or exclude us from persecution and suffering? Perhaps because this passage is a reminder that despite the common worldview, the common theology, Despite that, prosperity and blessings don't always come automatically to those who are good and who believe. Because if that was the case, wouldn't all of us here be overflowing with prosperity and blessings? I mean, we're all really good people. Wouldn't all of us here be getting those clean bills of health and those flush bank statements and that easy-peasy life of living big and living well? Instead, perhaps, this passage is a reminder that faith does not preclude us from suffering or pain or the type of brokenness that the gospel reading proclaims. Being good doesn't preclude us from suffering, much like, as I'm sure we all know personally, much like how loving your neighbor as yourself doesn't prevent arguments and division. What if I told you that the opposite of faith is not doubt? Sure, the thesaurus may say otherwise. The thesaurus may list doubt as an antonym right next to atheism. I found that interesting. But what if, instead of doubt, what if the opposite of faith was sin? Because really, I imagine that doubt is a part of faith. Believing in the unbelievable requires a little bit of doubt around the edges. But sin is a distraction from faith. Sin is what makes you, what makes all of us think we can do it ourselves. We don't need God's promises. We don't need God's love or the love from our neighbors. Sin is what makes us seek to know as an absolute instead of to know as a hope. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Sin is what happens when we no longer are hoping for things. Sin is what happens when we demand to see the things not seen. Sin is what happens when we are forced into relationships that are not about love like the relationships about which Jesus preaches in today's gospel. Sin is what makes us think that the fire Jesus brought is an incinerating fire, a fire of destruction, instead of perhaps a fire of cleansing and inspiration, much like the fire brought by the Holy Spirit during Pentecost. As I've already said, faith doesn't preclude us from suffering and pain and heartbreak but sin guarantees it. So I challenge you, all of you, to embrace the faith that is in each and every one of us, the faith that we have for God, for Jesus, for the world and our neighbors, regardless of whether we like them or not, and to honestly assess what sin is doing to prevent you, to prevent each of us from seeking out the faith that God so desperately wants from each of us, a faith that is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen, a faith that will part 
the Red Sea and close the mouths of lions, a faith that will be with us even in our anger and our pain and our brokenness and our doubt, especially our doubt. So have faith. Have faith faith in knowing that God's plans are for far greater things for each of us than we could ever do or imagine. None of us have to do it alone. Have faith. Amen. Let us stand together and declare our belief through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance, in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others either silently or aloud. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have, we have not, not loved, loved you with our whole heart. We, we have, have not, not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are, we are truly sorry and we and humbly, humbly repent. repent. For the, For the sake, sake of your Son, Son Jesus Christ, Christ have, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. 
Amen. Please stand as you're able. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us exchange a sign of peace with one another. Peace. Lord bless. As you're finding your seats, our vestry person of the day is coming forward. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Michelle Barkalow. I'm the vestry person of the day, and I'd like to welcome all of you to St. Philip's, uh, both visitors and regular parishioners. And uh, if you would like to talk to me after the service, I will be right over there and address any questions or concerns about the church you might have, and I'm sure that clergy and uh, your ushers would be responsive to that as well. We are glad you're here, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank, Thank you. you, Michelle. Several brief announcements. One, mark your calendars, and you can read about it in all the various forms of communication we have, but on September 11th, we're having one service at 10 o'clock, all the eight o'clockers, all the 10 o'clockers, and all the beachgoers are coming back home. It's our first service back together again. It's homecoming, and we're gonna follow the service with a wonderful luncheon in the parish hall, so read more about it, but mark your calendars. September 11th is homecoming. Also, our new building, the parish offices, are finally available for use. So if you have an organization, a ministry, you need to meet in there for something, let Lorraine know, and she will schedule that for you. The uh, punch list is basically done with one exception. We know what day that is, but we can schedule around that. So if you want to use that, please let Lorraine know in the parish offices. And some of you may not know, I don't know why you wouldn't know, but some of you may not know that Ken and Jim offers Bible studies by Zoom. And he does one on Thursday. And there's another one that takes place another day of the week. But there's still room for the Thursday morning Zoom Bible study if you want to join that and take part in it. It just so happens that his Saturday morning Bible study is all here today. I'm just going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to introduce yourself or anything, but just, just stand and see how many people are visiting with us today. It's good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. And today we do have a ministry minute. Debbie Skillman is going to come and speak to us about her ministry. Choir. Good morning. Yes, I'm Debbie Skillman. You generally can see maybe the tippy top of my head over there. Um, this is a ministry minute for choir or the music ministry here at St. Philip's. We've no less days to sing God's praise. Sing to the Lord a new song. Hark the herald angels sing. Sing choirs of angels. Songs of thankfulness and praise, Jesus, Lord, to thee we raise. At the Lamb's high feast we sing. Hymns of praise, then let us sing. Alleluia. Praise for the singing. Praise for the morning. I sing a song of the saints of God. Early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Alleluia. Sing to Jesus. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. I like that one. I'll repeat that one. Let those who refuse to sing who never knew our God. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sings. Since Lord is love of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? Expressions of sorrow, joy, hope, faith, fear, love, strength, courage, comfort, conflict, yearning, and adoration are all found in the text of hymns and anthems. I am sure that had I sung the 16 hymn text excerpts I just read to you, you would easily be able to join in singing them. Have you heard the expression, when words fail, 
music speaks. Words are easily forgotten, but words married to melody, harmony, and rhythm cause us to feel more deeply, often bringing visceral responses. Music is meant to elevate worship and cause us to be moved, to actually experience our faith, to feel it at a cellular level. I felt it when you sang the first hymn this morning. Please consider joining our group of music ministers here at St. Philip's by becoming a member of our choir. The choir needs new voices in its ranks as the pandemic and life changes have lessened the number of our members. The music ministry requires a fondness for singing, attendance at rehearsal on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. and Sunday worship throughout the year, as well as other high holy days. We are an accepting community of believers who are called to make a joyful noise to the Lord. My contact information is in the bulletin, and I'd love to answer any questions you might have. We begin our program meal on September the 7th with a potluck at 5 p.m. in the parish hall, followed by our first rehearsal in our new choir room. Thank you, Debbie. St. Paul says, pray without ceasing. I think it was Francis of Assisi who said, he who sings prays twice. There's like 25 seats over there. Wouldn't it be grand if we had to add some seats? So I encourage you, join with Debbie, join with the choir, and fill those seats up with us. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. That the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit.